To create a 3GS game, we must start with some basic project setup that gets a cube spinning on screen. After that, we'll learn a bit about materials, lights, and shadows to give our scene an interesting look. Next, we'll code our own physics engine with gravity and movement. Then we'll add enemies that launch themselves at us over time. Finally, we'll fine tune things so we get a look that's cohesive and a game that's fun to play. This course is brought to you by my own platform, Chris Courses, where I have over 100 game and web development related tutorials, quizzes, and code challenges meant to take your skills to the next level. If you'd like to support the channel, then be sure to subscribe over there. Otherwise, let's get started. To create a 3GS game, we need to do a bit of project setup. This means creating all the necessary folders and files required to actually get a game running in the browser. So let's start by doing that. Let's create a folder in a location that makes sense for us. I'm going to go over to my desktop and I like creating all my games within a web directory. That makes sense for me because this is going to be used directly within the web. So when I'm in my folder, I want to find a little bit of space and right click and then hit new folder to create the new location for our game. I'm going to call this game three js-game, simple enough. And now I can begin using this within a text editor. So I'm going to open up my text editor of choice. That is going to be Sublime Text. And once I've opened up Sublime Text, you can see I just have a blank file. So I want to begin writing in this, but first let's save this as what we need to save it as. I'm going to hit Command S to initiate a save, and I'm going to find that web folder in which we have our 3JS game. I'm going to call this no other than index.html, a basic name for a basic game. And I want to save this within 3JS-game. I save that, and now we have the base file in which we're going to create our whole game in. So that's going to be step one, but what comes next? Well, now we need to install 3JS. So there are a few ways in which we can install 3JS. We can do it through a package manager using something like NPM or Yarn, or we can use a CDN link. Now, both of these have their pros and cons. When we use something like NPM or Yarn, well, we have a list of all the packages that are going to be used within our project through something called package.json, but it also comes at the expense of we need to download Node for this to work. We need to download Yarn for this to work. We need to make sure that we're installing the correct packages, that we even have the correct version of NPM or Yarn in the first place. There's a lot of headache that can come with this, especially when creating a tutorial which I would like to last as long as possible. Therefore, we're going to be using the second method to install 3GS, and that's going to be by using a CDN link, just because it is a lot easier to get things up and running right off the bat. Now, there is one caveat here for this method, and that is this will only work if your script code is written within your HTML file. Otherwise, it requires a web server. We don't really need a web server for this basic game, and we're not going to write that much code, which we really need to split things up into files. Yes, that would make our code just a little cleaner, but for what we're doing right here, it's going to be totally okay to just get up and running with this. So it's important to note that we're going to be using the most recent version of 3GS as of March 20, 2023, and that is 0.150.1. If you want this tutorial to work perfectly for you, you need to make sure that you have this correct version. Otherwise, you're going to be like, why doesn't this work for me when it works for him perfectly? He's doing something wrong, not me. It's his fault. I get that all the time in the comments, by the way. I don't want that happening, I know you don't either, so make sure that you install the correct version. So let's install 3JS, how do we do that? Well, we're going to import some boilerplate code. This does assume that you have a little bit of knowledge with 3JS, and there are tons of tutorials out there that'll teach you the basics. I even have one myself on my channel, which you can reference right here if you need a little bit of coverage on the basics. But what you see right here is just going to get a basic cube up and running on the screen, nothing that you haven't seen before. So I want to make sure that we can just easily copy and paste this to get our game up and running as soon as possible. Now, where would we get this code? Well, I put it directly on chriscourses.com just so we can easily copy and paste it. It's completely free. You don't have to do anything. Just head to the link and copy and paste it like I'm about to do. So on this page right here, it's going to be project setup of our 3JS game. We're going to scroll down and you can see that boilerplate code. We're going to go to the top and scroll down to the bottom until I select it all. Hit command C to copy. And now I can go back to Sublime Text over here and paste that directly within index.html. So if we hit save and then open this on up in the browser, which you can do by double clicking your file right here, you're going to see a basic cube spinning around in the browser. That's exactly what we want to start. Pretty basic, but we knocked out all the boring stuff, which is great. Now, really quickly, let's go over that boilerplate code in case you're unfamiliar with it. So to start, we have a style tag 
and inside of that I'm selecting the body and setting its margin equal to zero. I'm setting this so I don't have any default margin applied by the browser. You can see, if I get rid of this, then go back to our game, that margin is now applied. I don't want that default margin, which is exactly why I added that right here. But we can effectively ignore this for the time being. We're not going to be using much CSS. These next two lines of scripts are going to be what allow me to import 3JS like you see right here, directly within the same file. So I'm importing this like a module, and this is how you import code with JavaScript using something like npm or yarn. But we don't have to install anything using those two, which makes it a lot easier. All we have to do is make sure that we're including these scripts right here, and as a result, we'll be able to import all of our 3JS code, and then import this add-on, which allows us to navigate our scene. You pretty much always want to use this add-on within 3JS, because it's going to be very helpful for debugging and navigating your scene. It's something that allows you to click, rotate, and then scroll in and out to make sure that things are working as expected. So in order to import 3.js and orbit controls, you need these two script tags, but we can effectively ignore them and focus on our script tag with a type of module. So as you can see, we have a scene, we have a camera and a render, and all these are being used to create what you see over here and render out our cube. But we wouldn't be able to see our cube if we didn't have this grouping code down here. We're creating a geometry, which is a box geometry that creates a cube. We're applying a mesh basic material, which is just a basic green color and we're combining these together to create a mesh and then adding that to our scene. And that is why we see this cube in the first place. We're pulling our camera back right here towards us away from the cube so that we can actually see it. We don't want our camera placed directly inside of the cube. That's why we're doing this. And then we're running a basic animation loop, which renders out our scene for every frame and then rotates our cube on the X and Y axis as well. Really simple stuff right here, but like I said, I cover that more in depth in my beginner course on YouTube, and plenty of other YouTubers have done this as well, so be sure to check out their courses too. But with that quick overview, we can go back to our to-do list and check off project setup. Next, I wanna focus on materials and lighting. So what are materials in 3.js? Well, materials determine how our 3.js object looks, and we're already using one on our cube over here. This is a mesh basic material. And the main thing to know about a mesh basic material is it does not require a light to see it. Most of the other materials do. What are some of the other materials that come with 3.js? Well, mesh fong material, mesh lambert material, mesh standard material, mesh tune material. These are just some of the materials that come with 3.js, but they are some of the most common, I would say, especially these three right here, fong, lambert, and standard. But what do each of these mean? How do they actually affect what object we're applying them to? Well, let's go down the list. This is what a mesh basic material looks like. As you can see, there are no shadows applied to our actual geometry. We just see one basic color. And we can make out the shape right now because we're using something called a torus knot. But if we were to go something like a cube and just look at it at one direction, we would not know that that is 3D because it doesn't have any shading applied to it. And that is where the other materials come in handy. Mesh fong material, you can really see the shading going on here. But one distinct feature is, it is shiny. We have a lot of shine going on here around the parts that are closest to the light in which we're shining on this object. So mesh fong material is more like a mesh shiny material. That's how I would think of it. Going to the next material, we have a mesh lambert material. This is a very matte material, and I always like thinking of this as, this is what is applied to Batman's Batmobile in the version with Christian Bale. So he has that really sleek matte Batmobile it's pretty much this exact color. You shine light at it and light is not going to shine off it. It'd be really weird to have a really shiny Batmobile that would definitely draw a lot of attention to it. So when you think of mesh Lambert material, think of mesh matte material instead. It does not really shine in comparison to the mesh fong material. Next, we have a mesh standard material, which I like to think of as a mesh combo material. It's kind of like a combination of mesh fong and mesh Lambert material. You can see there's a little bit of shine applied, but there's also some matteness going on around the edges. And we can really alter these properties to make it even more shiny or even more matte directly within the object arguments. So it's very customizable and more of a combo material than rather just being, hey, this is matte or this is shiny. Now it's very important to note, mesh basic material is the only one that works without a light. Those other ones I just mentioned, Fong, Lambert, and Standard, they require a light to work. Over here, you can see, this is what a mesh standard material looks like without a light. Not very interesting because we can't even see the freaking thing in the first place. So before we go on to lighting, let's apply a material to our cube so I can show you what that looks like without a light. As you can see, currently on line 40, we have a mesh basic material being applied. I want to delete this 
and replace it with a mesh standard material instead. And we're going to keep the same color that we have right now, which is going to be green in hexadecimal format. If I save that and refresh, well, our cube is completely gone. Why? Well, no other than we don't have a light shining on it. Let's make sure that we add that light, but how do we even add a light in the first place? In 3JS, there are going to be a few lights we can use, the most popular being the ambient light, directional light, point light, and spotlight. So if I were to go over these really quickly, you can see that our directional light comes in from one direction, and it's going to create a lot of shadow right behind the object of where the light source is shining. So all that shadow would be over here because all of our light is coming from the top left corner. A point light is basically like a light bulb. So if we're gonna add a light bulb, it's going to shine in all directions, but we can place this in very specific locations on our scene. For instance, we could place it directly in front of our cube. That means it's only going to light up that one front of the cube, but it has potential to light up everything around it as well. We also have a spotlight. It's going to work very similarly to the directional light, as in shadows are going to be over here, but they're going to be much more circular and much more focused compared to the directional light. I know you guys know what a spotlight is. You've seen it in plays, you've seen it in movies. It's the exact same thing within 3JS. The other light, which I didn't show right here within this diagram, is going to be the ambient light. And the ambient light is basically just going to light up our whole scene, no matter where our objects are. There is no position for the ambient light. It just says, if you have some sort of material that isn't mesh basic material, this right here, ambient light is going to light it up to make sure that we can actually see it. So you can give off really cool tints using an ambient light. Let's say you want like a reddish or a blue tint. You can apply a directional light to get some shadows going and then apply an ambient light to give a tint to everything on your screen. But these are definitely the most commonly used lights that you'll see within 3JS. We are going to use the ambient and also the directional light to light up our cube. Let's start with the directional light so we can start seeing some shadows. To add a directional light to our scene, I'm going to go right beneath where we're adding in a cube, and I'm going to create a light with const light, and set this equal to a new, three, all uppercase, directional light. Now this takes two arguments. The first is going to be, what color do we want this light to be? I want it to be white, so I'll specify that with the hexadecimal value of 0x, ff, ff, ff. That is going to give us a white value. And then the second argument is going to be, how intense do we want this light to be? How intense do we want it to shine? Really bright or not so much, really dim? I want it to shine as bright as we can. Well, I guess not as bright as we can, but pretty bright. So I'll give it a value of one. We'll save that. And then I want to add this to our scene, which we can do with scene.add light. So as long as we add all that code correctly, save and refresh, we can now see a little bit of our cube and there's definitely some shading going on, but something weird is happening. And we can really only see certain sides at a time because our light is currently inside of our cube. We never set its position, so it's giving off this really weird effect since it's inside of it. What we want to do is pull our light closer to us. And we can do that by affecting its Z position. So before we add in our light, I'm going to specify I want our light dot position on the Z axis equal to, let's say, three, and that'll push it closer towards us. We save and refresh, and now we can really see everything going on with this cube. We have that shading in place. Thanks to our mesh standard material, we can click and drag around to get a better view. It's kind of hard to see when we only have one object and everything is black, but you get the idea. We now have a light applied with our three directional light, but eventually we're going to want shadows projected onto another object. And that is up next on shadows, but before we get there, let me show you what this looks like before we actually apply the shadow properties. Let's create some sort of plane right beneath this cube right here to act as the platform for our game. I want this to be either square or rectangular, it doesn't really matter, let's just go ahead and create the thing. So we have our cube being created right here, and I know I want to create something similar to a cube, but not exactly a cube. I want it to be more boxy, a little flat, something that resembles a plane. I'm not going to use a plane geometry, but I'm still going to use this box geometry. I'm going to copy these four lines right here, paste them down below, and now I can edit this as needed to create the geometry I want. But right now we have variables that are named the same thing, specifically constants. I can't actually create a new geometry const because it is created above. I can't create a new material const because it's created above, same with cube. So we either need to change the names of these materials or we can inline things. 
I like inlining things and then refactoring as needed before creating these constants. So let's go ahead and do that. I'll get rid of our constant of geometry and then take our geometry instantiation right here. And I know previously we had a geometry const, which I just deleted. I can just paste in this box geometry instantiation right here directly. I don't actually need to specify that this is a material const. I kind of already know that just based on the fact that this instantiator is a mesh standard material. I know that's a material. I don't really need that constant material to help signify that this is what this is. This already indicates what it is just based on the method name of mesh standard material. So it's kind of duplicative and kind of tedious to have to write these constant materials in geometry. I can just get rid of them and inline things directly like this. Now cube is still duplicative. We have it up above and we have it right here. But this isn't really going to be a cube, but rather our ground. So I'm going to rename it in both of those places, right here and right here where we add it to the scene. And I want to make sure that I'm not creating a perfect cube with a width of one, a height of one, and also a depth of one. I want our height to be smaller than everything else. So this value right here, the second one, is going to be our height. I want this to be 0.5. Save and refresh. And you can see we have some sort of rectangular prism directly within our cube. I want this beneath our cube though. So before we add in our ground, I'm going to select it, get its position on the Y axis, and I want to push this down. So I'll set this equal to a value of, let's just say negative two, save that. And now you can see we have a ground for our cube to rest on, eventually at least. Now let's make this a lot larger than it is. For our width property, I'm going to increase this to a value of five, and then our depth, I'm going to increase to a value of 10, it should definitely stretch things out a bit. And now we have this nice long platform for our cube to fall on top of. But I do want to differentiate it a little bit from our green cube. So let's change the color of this. Instead of saying that this is going to be green, I'm going to replace our F values with zero to say, I don't want any green applied to this. I actually want to replace the last two zeros with FF, which means I want to apply a blue value instead. Save that, refresh, and now we have a blue floor. Although it's a little hard to see our blue floor, let's brighten it up a bit by taking our light position, but this time on its y-axis, I want it to pull the light up so that it's shining at an angle rather than just shining straight forward. If we set this equal to a higher value to something like, let's say two, save that, refresh, this is definitely a little bit brighter. And I think the higher we move this y value and the less we move our z value, let's replace the two, swap out, y with three and z with two. You can see that our light is getting higher up and we can see more and more of our platform right here. So if I click and drag around, you can see this is where our cube is going to land. It's a lot easier to see exactly where everything is when we move things, but we don't have any shadow beneath our cube right here on top of our actual platform. And that is what we're going to cover next. So let's go back to to do and check off materials and lighting. So how do we project a shadow onto our ground from our cube? Well, we're going to need to set a few properties. What are those properties? They're going to be render.shadowmap.enabled, light.castshadow, mesh.receiveshadow, and mesh.castshadow. We need to make sure that all four of these are set equal to true to make sure that we can get a shadow showing on our scene. So let's go step by step to make sure that this works. We want to select our render. That's going to be on line 33 for me. Once I have my render selected, I want to select its shadow map property, which in return has an enable property, and I want to set this equal to true. I want to enable the renderer's shadow map, and make sure that you spell this correctly, unlike me, should be renderer, refresh, and you can see, well, no shadow. We really need those three other properties in order for this to work, so the other three properties were no other than light. I'm going to write this on line 55, right beneath where our light is created and it's going to be cast shadow. Should our light cast a shadow, true or false? And it's going to be equal to true. I do want our light casting a shadow onto our cube and then onto our ground. If I refresh after saving that, still no cigar, but we need to add a few more properties over here, specifically to our cube. So for me, our cube is on line 42. I want to take our cube and get its cast shadow property. Should this cube cast a shadow? I think so. Let's set that equal to true, save and refresh. Still nothing because we need to specify what object should be receiving a shadow. That is going to be our ground. So I want to select our ground. 
and then say that it should receive a shadow. Is that true or false? Yes, of course, it should be receiving a shadow from our cube. And as long as we have these four properties in place and we did everything correctly, we should see a shadow being shined onto our ground. So let me refresh. And there is our shadow. Perfect. So from this angle, our light is up here. It is shining downwards and it is projecting a shadow to the small little area right here behind our cube. This is how things are working, but we need to make sure that we set those four properties directly to true in order for all this to work together. That's just the way it works within 3JS. I personally wish that these were all true by default, but that's not the way it is. So you need to make sure that you set them manually. But that's really all you need to know to get started with shadows within 3GS. Just make sure that these four properties are set equal to true. So with that, we can head back to our to-do list and check off shadows. So now we are going to cover gravity. We all know that gravity makes things fall, but it's important to understand how it makes things fall so that we can get a realistic effect within our game. So gravity is a constant downward acceleration on the y-axis. It obviously pulls things down, but the longer those objects are in the air, the quicker that they are pulled down. You can see over here we have two boxes, one falling at a constant rate and one falling at a rate where gravity is applied. With the constant rate box, for every second this box is falling, it travels at a constant rate. All these little segments right here are the exact same distance and eventually it'll reach the bottom of the ground in which it hits. Now we have a box over here where gravity is applied and you can see for every second the distance in which this box travels gets larger and larger for every second. And that is because we are adding onto this box's y velocity. As the y velocity gets greater and greater, it means that it can travel a further distance for every frame or every second in which it is in the air. So to make our box move, we are first going to apply a constant rate velocity, and then we're going to add a gravity velocity to give off that realistic effect. Because what we see over here when gravity is applied, it's going to resemble what we see here on Earth, where we are pulled down to the ground and we accelerate towards the ground, rather than just fall at a constant rate. So how do we go about implementing a constant rate velocity before we go on to the gravity velocity? Right now in our current simulation, we have our cube spinning around, and I really just want to focus on a still cube because this is really going to complicate things if it just keeps rotating. So let's go back to our code, and within our animation loop, I'm going to comment out where we are rotating our cube on the X and Y axis. Save that, refresh, and now we seem to be in good shape. So we need to get our cube falling downwards. Right now, our cube's Y position is right in the center of the cube. That is where 3JS places the Y position. By default, is in the center of the object you create. So what we need to do is start adding on a value to this Y position. For every frame that our animation loop runs, by the way, if we add on one value, let's just say it is going to be something like 0 0.01, if we begin adding on 0 0.01 to this value right here, for every frame of our animation, well, it's going to push this dot downwards, and as a result, it's going to push our cube downwards. And the goal is to stop it once it hits our ground down below. But let's start by adding on this value of 0 0.01 to our Y position. So we want to focus on our animation loop because that is where every frame occurs within our rendering. So after we render every frame, I'm going to select our cube and get its position on the y-axis. And now I want to add onto this a specific velocity. And I could say, for every frame of our animation, take the cube position on the y-axis, add onto it this new value. So if I were to add on that 0 0.01, which I was showing earlier, save and refresh, you're going to see that our cube is traveling upwards because the higher you go within a 3JS y-axis, the larger the values get. So really, we want our cube to fall downwards. And to make our cube fall downwards, we need a negative velocity because that is going to pull it down. So instead of just saying subtract equals, I'm going to say we're going to add on to this a negative velocity, which means that we're pushing our cube down instead of up. So let's save that, refresh, and now we are going down. Perfect. But where is our cube going? If I zoom out, well, it just keeps on going. That is not really what we would like. We would like for our cube to stop on top of our ground right there. So how would we go about implementing that? How would we get our cube to stop? Well, before we do that, let me illustrate it. I'm going to stop our cube from falling. And what we want to do is we want to get the bottom of our cube, this value right here on the Y axis. We're going to get the bottom of our cube and then we need to get to the top of our ground. 
So whatever that value is right there. How do we go about getting the bottom of our cube? Well, we need to get its y position, which is going to be in the center of our cube by default, and then we need to get our cube's height. That's going to be this over here. And then we need to divide it by two. If we divide that by two, we effectively get this area right here. And if we subtract that from our cube's current y position, we are going to get the bottom of the cube. That's exactly what we want. So why do we even need the bottom of our cube and the top of the ground in the first place? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to detect for collision within every frame of our animation. And if the bottom of our cube ever intersects with the top of our ground right here, we're going to prevent our cube from moving altogether. And that's going to give off the illusion as if it's actually stopping on top of the ground. So we need to test for intersection within every frame of our animation. But to do that, we need the bottom of the cube and the top of our ground. Let's start by getting the bottom of the cube. So we know we have the y position here. Now we need to get the height divided by two and take our y position, subtract that divided by two height. So first thing first, let me console log out our cube.height. Let's see what that is. I'm going to save, refresh, and then I'm going to open up my inspector. And you can see right here, our height is undefined. Why is that? Well, 3GS does not provide a height property to the mesh by default, which is a little unfortunate because that would be very helpful for this scenario. But nevertheless, we can always customize our class to make sure that it does include this height property that we want to use. How do we customize our class? Well, to customize this three mesh class in which we want to grab a height, I'm going to create a completely new class that kind of bounces off that three dot mesh class. So to create a class, I'm going to do this right beneath controls. Doesn't really matter where you do it, I suppose. But nevertheless, let's create that class. I'm going to call this box with a capital B. And then I want to specify that this extends our three dot mesh class. And make sure that your three is all uppercase, otherwise this will not work. And then you want to close things off with some opening and closing curly brackets. So what we're saying right here is this class of box that we're creating inherits all of the properties and all of the methods associated with three dot mesh. We want everything there and we're going to throw it inside of our new box class, but we're going to extend it. We're going to make sure that we can include a property like height, but we just need to make sure that we use this new box class rather than three dot mesh later on. That's besides the point, but let's go ahead and create the extra height property. To create that extra height property, I'll add in a constructor method for our box. And this is going to be called whenever we instantiate a new box. But before we instantiate a new box, I always want to make sure that we are calling the instantiator that came with 3.mesh. What do I mean by that? What is the instantiator that came with 3.mesh? Well, it is this right here, 3.mesh geometry material. I wanna make sure that we're always passing through some sort of geometry and some sort of material so that we can utilize 3.mesh correctly. We need to make sure that we're creating mesh in the first place before we can start adding out properties and so forth. So I'm going to call within our constructor a super method, which calls the parent constructor of 3.mesh, which is essentially this right here. So if I want to integrate this into our super, I need to take this geometry and place it as the first argument within our super method. And then I need to take the second argument, which is our material, and place it within the second argument of super. So all this does right here is it calls the constructor of the parent class, which is 3.mesh, and you can see we're doing that down below right here. We need to make sure that our box, whenever we create it, creates the actual mesh, which will render this out within a 3.js scene. So that is why we're doing this. But we're referencing geometry and material, which are not available to us because we're inside of a class, and we created those down below. So we could do one of two things here. We could grab these two lines and then above super, we can paste this in. And now this is totally valid, but this might be a little too much for my liking because we already know that the first argument within 3.mesh is going to be some sort of geometry. It's a little duplicative to say that this is a geometry because we already know that this over here represents a geometry. It simply says box geometry. We know absolutely that this is a geometry. So I'm not going to create a cost for this. I'm actually going to delete that and remove geometry right here, replacing it with a new three box geometry. And I can do the same thing for material. We know that mesh standard material is material. We don't need to repeat ourselves by assigning it to a const of material. So I'll grab that, replace the material const with 
a new three mesh standard material, and this will work exactly the same as prior. But the cool thing is, when we create our cube, we're no longer going to use the standard new three mesh we're using here. Instead, we're going to create a new object based off of our new class. So I want to create a new box, and this doesn't take any arguments by default. We're specifying the box geometry and the mesh standard material directly within here. But as long as we've done things correctly, we can save this, and then refresh, and our cube remains without any errors. That's exactly what we want to start. But now what we can do is we can add a property inside of our box constructor called this dot height. Let's say I want to set this equal to, I don't know, a standard value like three. As long as I do this, save and refresh, and then open up our console, you're going to see that now height is defined. We have a height of three because that is what we specified right here for our box property of height. So even though we set height equal to three, this is not actually representative of the height of our box because the height of our box is specified by the second argument within our box geometry, and that is currently equal to one. So what we'd want to do is pass through an argument whenever we create a new box that specifies the height we want our mesh to be at. And I'm going to do that by passing through one singular argument. It's going to be an object, but it's going to have multiple properties inside of it so we can start using things like labels. Let's say maybe I want a width property. I'll add that in as a property. I'll add that in. Maybe we want a height property. We definitely want a height property actually. So add that, and then maybe we want a depth property. We're going to add all three of those. But the cool thing is, is now we can use these as arguments when we create a new box geometry. So rather than having to look at the docs to understand what this one right here is, we can pass through a width instead, and that is a lot more declarative than just putting arbitrary ones here. I'm going to do the same thing for the third argument. And now we know exactly what each of these arguments represent. The first one is the width, the second is the height, and the third is the depth. And the cool thing is, when we create this new box, now we can pass through that one additional argument, which is just a simple object, but it has multiple properties. What are they? Width, height, and depth. So what is our box width going to be? It's going to be equal to one because that's what we had right here earlier. What is our height going to be? It's going to be one because that's what we had here earlier as well. And then what should our depth be? It should also be one because that's what we had when we created a new box geometry. So given that we've done everything correctly, our box should look exactly the same. So save, refresh, and that is perfect. So that's pretty cool. When we create a new box, now we have a new way of creating a mesh on the scene, but it's a lot more specific because we're declaring what the width should be, what the height should be, and what the depth should be. This is a lot more declarative than what we had earlier where we'd have to look at the docs to see what each of these arguments actually are. When creating new classes, I highly recommend doing things this way simply because the labels are really going to help you out in the long term. And this is just a lot more enjoyable to work with in my opinion than kind of guessing things within the arguments. But just to prove to you that this works, watch what happens when I change our height to something like two, save and refresh. Now our box is automatically that tight because we're passing it through as an argument right here, through our constructor and as our new three box geometry. So it's kind of like this whole chain that goes into three dot mesh, but we're customizing it in the best way possible to make our code cleaner and also more enjoyable to work with. So this dot height right now is equal to three. That's just a static value that I set. I want this equal to the actual height we're passing through right here. So not only are we going to pass it through our box geometry, we're going to set our this dot height property. And let's do the same thing for our width and our depth. I'm just going to copy this line a few times, change height to width. And then for the third one, I'm going to change that to depth. And now if we ever need to reference our boxes width, height or depth later on, we have the ability to do that because we're setting specific properties right here. So I'm going to change our height back to one. And one more time, let's save, refresh, open up your console and you'll see we're getting that exact height value of one. So where did we even leave off in this case? Well, we're trying to get the bottom of our cube right here and we didn't have height available to us, but now we do, so now we can get it. To get the bottom of that cube, we were console logging out cube.height but we want to divide that by two. That is going to give us this little subsection right here. And now I want to take our cube dot position dot y and subtract from that cube height divided by two. And that should give us the bottom side of our cube. Let's save that, open up our console, refresh. You can see the bottom of our cube is at a value of 0 0.5, negative 0 0.5 that is. 
So we have that, but now what we need to get is the top of our platform. You'll see if I zoom out right here by scrolling, try to get this in a good position, we need to get the top of this platform. We can get the top of the platform the same way we got the bottom of the cube, but we're going to do things a little differently. Rather than subtract one half the height from this position right here, we're going to add one half the height, and that'll give us the top of whatever mesh we are dealing with. So let's comment out this console log, and I'm going to create a new one that gets the top of our ground. So I'll get our ground.position.y, that's going to be the center of our ground. And I don't want to subtract the height divided by two, I want to add the height divided by two. So I'm going to add our ground.height divided by two, and let's see what that gives us. We'll save, refresh, and open up our console, and we get NAN, which stands for not a number. What's going on here? Well, right now, ground.height is not available to us. Why is that? Well, if we look at where we are creating our ground, we're still using a standard three mesh, when in reality, we should be using that new box class, in which we have the this.height property available to us. So we're going to refactor this a bit. I'm going to bump this down below for reference, and then I want to create a new box, which takes what arguments? Right now it only takes a width, height, and a depth, but I think that's all we need for the time being. We'll add in a width property and specify that's going to be equal to five, a height property equal to 0.5, a depth property, equal to 10, and then it looks like we have a different color, we'll change that in a second, but let's get rid of this old code, save, and see how things look. And yeah, that's looking great, but we do have the same color as our box up here. So how would we change the color of our ground that uses our new box class? Well, I'm going to preemptively specify I want to pass a color through, and what color do I want to pass through? Well, a string that has a pound sign, and that's going to indicate this is a hexadecimal value. And I want that same blue value. So red is going to be zero, zero, no red applied there. Green is going to be zero, zero, no green applied. But I do want the full amount of blue applied, which I can specify with FF. So now this is going to pass through our constructor up here, but we need to specify we're passing it through in order to access it. So I'm going to say, I want to pass through a color as well, and I actually want a default associated with this color, and that default is going to be the green already applied to our current cube right here. And that value is 00FF00. So color by default will be equal to a value of pound sign 00FF00. So now if I don't pass a color through, like I'm not doing right here for cube, it's automatically going to have this color value of green. So now I can get rid of this static value and specify color should be equal to the color we're passing through. And a quick code tip for you is, if the value right here for your property is the same as the value you're passing to it, like they have the same name, I suppose I'm trying to say, you don't need the second value right here. You can get rid of it and just use the one singular value of color instead. This right here is the exact same thing as this right here because they have the same name. So we'll do the shorthand method, save, Refresh, and now we have what we had earlier. Our box is green because it uses the default, and then our ground is blue because we're passing through a new color that we set within our instantiation right here. So now that our ground is using this new box class, let's open up our console one more time, and you can see that this is the top value of our ground. Let me go ahead and zoom out so we can actually see it. This is the top value of the ground, negative 1.75. So if I go back, and uncomment this console log right here, which indicates the bottom of our cube. Refresh with our console open. You can see we need to make this value right here be less than or equal to 1.75, and once that happens, that's when we're going to prevent our cube from moving any further downwards. That's how this is going to work. So we definitely need these two values right here, but one thing I want to note is, if we look at this code right here, which represents the bottom of our mesh, and we come back to this at a later point in time, we might not understand what this is at first glance. It would be a lot more helpful in this case to assign this to some sort of variable which really explicitly states what this is, so we have a better understanding when we come back to this at a later point in time. So I'm going to grab this code right here within our first console log, which represents the bottom of our cube, delete the console log, and I'm going to go up to our box, and inside of our constructor, I'm going to add a new property called this dot bottom. It's going to be equal to exactly what was within that console log statement. 
but rather than use a specific object like cube, I'm going to replace both instances of cube right here with this instead. And now we can get the bottom of our ground if we wish because it also uses this box class and it's going to make things a lot more flexible later on when we start doing hardcore collision detections between our box enemies and so forth. Let's do the same thing for the top side of our ground and that is indicated by this console log right here. I'll grab that code, delete the console log and head back on up and specify that the top of whatever mesh we're dealing with it's so going to be equal to not our ground position and ground height, but rather this dot height and this dot position y instead. So now we can get the top of our cube as well as the bottom, and then the top of our ground and also the bottom of the ground. So perfect. With these values, we can begin detecting for a collision over time. But right now, our bottom and our top are only set within our constructor. They're only set when we actually create the object. I need these to update for every frame of our animation because for every frame we're going to be pushing our cube downwards. And if this isn't updated for every frame, well, we're going to get the old value of where it's placed initially and things are just not going to work. So I want to update this for every frame. This is how I would prefer to do it. I'm going to create a new method within our box class called update. Within update, I'm going to take these two lines right here and call them as the very first thing with an update. So now, whatever object I want these properties to update with as it animates, all I have to do is go inside of our animation loop and then call something like cube.update. And for every frame, we're going to make sure that our bottom and our top properties are updated accordingly. And inside of this update method, we can also do things like detect for collision. So now that we know that this is updated accordingly, Let's start moving our cube downwards by updating its velocity property. So right now, we are doing that down below where we commented out cube position y plus equal to negative 0.01. I'm going to do this dynamically instead so we can stay within our class up above. So after we update bottom and top, I'm going to call this dot position dot y. And I want to add onto this, this dot velocity dot y. So whatever velocity is associated with whatever mesh we're currently dealing with. But we don't actually have a velocity property defined. Let's go ahead and define that now. Right beneath top, I'll add in that property called this dot velocity. And this is going to be equal to a velocity that we pass through as an argument so that we can get things moving at different rates. This will especially come in handy for when we create new enemies. But I need to create this as an argument up above if I want to use it. So after a color, I'll add a comma specify that I want a velocity property. I'm going to set this equal to a default value. It's going to be an object with an x equal to zero, a y equal to zero, and then a z equal to zero as well. So what I'm saying here is objects should not be moving around on the x, y, or z axis by default. But if we do want an object moving, we can specify that whenever we create that new object. So I know I want my box or my cube to be falling down towards the ground. So I'll add in a velocity property and set that equal to an object with an x property of zero, a y of negative one because I want it falling down, and then a z of zero as well. If I do this, refresh, you're going to see that falls really fast because negative one is way, way, way too much for what we're dealing with right here. Let's change that to 0 0.01 instead and see how things look. Refresh. And that is looking pretty darn good, I would say. So now we need to write a condition that stops our cube from falling down through our ground. We're going to do that by getting the bottom of our cube and comparing that against the top of our ground. So up here in update is where I want to begin writing this conditional. After we add on to position.y, I want to say if this dot bottom, the bottom of our current cube, is less than or equal to our ground's top property, then I want it to take this dot velocity dot y and set it equal to zero. We should not be moving anymore as soon as our bottom passes through our ground's top or if it's equal to ground top. But I need ground available to us, so I'm going to pass that through as an argument right here. And then wherever we're calling update, which is on line 112 for me, cube.update, I need to pass through that ground object. So let's save, refresh, and you're going to see we're not actually moving at all. What is going on here? Why is our condition evaluating to true even though it should be false for at least a few seconds? Well, the best way to debug this is console log out our two objects. Let's console log out our ground 
dot top, and then I'm also going to console log out our cube dot bottom. Let's save, refresh, open up the console, and you can see our ground top is equal to 0.25, but the bottom of our cube is equal to negative 0.5. So right now it's saying that the top of our ground is higher up than the bottom of our cube, when obviously that just isn't the case right here. What's going on is, we're not taking into account the initial position of our ground on the y-axis. You'll see down below, somewhere, right here on line 98 for me, we're setting our ground's position on the y-axis equal to negative 2. But we're never actually taking that into account whenever we update bottom and top to this.position.y. As a result, it's throwing off the location of our box's top property. So we need to fix this. We need to set our position property whenever we create a new box. And I'm going to do that by adding in that new property right beneath velocity. It's going to be equal to this dot position. Now, if you try to set this dot position, by default, this isn't going to work because this dot position is a property already available on 3.mesh. You might think, yes, this is something that we can set because it's available on 3.mesh already, but it's a read-only property. Therefore, if we try setting this, we're going to get a bug. We need to set it a different way. We're going to set it with this.position.set which is available to us because, like I said, this dot position is a three dot mesh property. And on top of that property, they included a set method. So we're going to set three new arguments inside of here. We're going to set a position dot x, a position dot y for the second argument, a position dot z for the third argument. But now we need to pass through a position object within our constructor up above. So right beneath the velocity, I'll add in a position object and this is going to have an x, y, and z. I'll just copy that from velocity, paste it in. And the last thing we need to do is make sure that we specify, whenever we create our ground, that we're going to place this in a different position from where it is. So right now we're specifying its position on the y-axis should be negative two down below. I wanna make sure that I do that within our constructor. So I'll grab our position, state that I want its x equal to zero, its y equal to negative two, and then it's z equal to zero. And we definitely want to delete ground position y equal to negative two because we're doing that right here instead. Save, and then refresh. You're going to see, while well, this is still the same, are we even doing anything helpful over here? Yes, I promise you we are, but we do need to make sure that we're setting our position before we set bottom and top because bottom and top both use this dot position, which we're setting down below. We need to make sure we call this first. So I'm gonna grab that and paste it up above bottom and top. Save and refresh, and now this is the correct value. And you can see, this actually works. Our cube stopped as soon as it hit the top side of our ground. That is pretty awesome to me. But this is a bit boring. Let's say we want to add some sort of bounce effect to this. If we want to bounce this, all we need to do is find where we are currently monitoring for this collision, which for me is on line 80 with this condition right here. Right now we're saying at the bottom of our cube intersects with the ground's top, then we're setting our velocity y equal to zero, that stops our cube from moving altogether. Instead of setting this equal to zero, I can set this equal to this dot velocity dot y, but what I'm going to do is reverse this velocity. If I reverse this velocity, or we're going to add on the inverse value right here to our position dot y, it should get our box moving upwards once it hits the top of our ground. We'll save, refresh, and it looks like we are actually stuck. So what's going on right here is, we are not predicting one frame into the future whether or not these two are about to collide, because we're not taking our y velocity into account within this equation. As a result, this conditional right here is going to evaluate as true, which means these two are going to swap, but for the very next frame, this is still going to evaluate as true, and it's going to do the same thing. These two are going to swap with each other, and it's just going to keep doing that over and over again. We can't really tell that it's happening over here within the browser because it's such a small value, but we do need to make sure that we're taking velocity into account. So I'm going to predict one frame into the future to see if the bottom of our cube collides with the ground's top by adding on to our bottom this dot velocity dot y and as long as we do that we should see a bounce effect and there it is now it's going to go upwards towards heaven until it reaches wherever it is it wants to go so we want this to fall back down towards the earth how do we make it fall back towards the earth well this is where gravity comes into play how do we add gravity to this well gravity is a constant downward acceleration 
Now we can get that constant downward acceleration by constantly adding on to this dot velocity dot y. So before we add on to our position, I'm actually going to add on to this dot velocity dot y a specific value, and you want this to be not too large, honestly, because otherwise it's going to be very fast. But I'll say that this value right here, 0 0.01, is our value of gravity. So we're going to make sure that we accelerate quicker and quicker for every frame of our animation. And once we hit the ground, we're still going to reverse our velocity and bounce back up. So let's save this, refresh, and you can see that just launches upwards. The issue here is, right now I'm adding on a positive gravity value, which means we're going upwards towards the large y-axis instead of downwards near the ground. So I need to make sure that this is a negative value. Save and refresh. And you can see we have a nice bouncing cube that keeps on bouncing until, well, it goes down towards, I guess that would be hell. Oh no. So to fix this, what we need to do is make sure that we're only actually changing our y position if there is no bounce. So right here, this if statement states, if we currently collided, if there is going to be a bounce, that is when we swap the velocity. Else, that's when we're going to actually add on to our position. That way we won't get any weird overlap that constantly adds on a y velocity until we're just pushed further and further through the actual ground. So let's save that, refresh, and yeah, that is looking a lot better. You can see this gives off a much more realistic effect compared to that constant motion which we had earlier. And this will look even better if we slow down our gravity a bit. Let's change this to something like 0 0.005 instead. And it's really not indicative of what 0 0.005 is at first glance. And that is a perfect use case for changing this into some sort of variable. So I'll take negative 0 0.005 and then create a new property called this.gravity. Set it equal to that value. And now for every frame we call update, I want to add on to our y velocity this.gravity gravity. Save that, refresh, and that is looking really good. Maybe I'll even slow this down a bit more. It all comes down to personal taste in the end. I'll make that 0 0.002. And yeah, that is really, really smooth, and I like that a lot. So one more thing we could do here to make this as realistic as possible is we could add some friction. Whenever we hit the ground, we're going to reduce the height in which we actually jump up. So where are we currently hitting the ground? It's going to be right here within this if statement. We can be extra explicit by commenting out, this is where we hit the ground. So not only am I going to reverse our velocity when we hit the ground, I'm going to reduce it. So I need to call more than one line. I'll add some curly brackets. And then right before I reverse the velocity, I'm going to take our velocity dot y and then multiply itself by a fraction, such as point, let's just say eight. So we're going to make this point eight times smaller for every time we actually bounce. It's going to give off the effect as if friction is taking place and we come to a stop eventually. Save and refresh. And you can see we have a really, really realistic bounce effect with that gravity here. I like the way that looks a lot, so I'm going to keep it. But the last thing I would do here for this gravity lesson is change this conditional into some sort of other method that describes what all this code does. Because yes, we know this is where we hit the ground, but it's still not purely indicative of what everything does as a whole. So what I'm going to do is take all this code right here, cut it out of update, and then create a new method called apply gravity. And it's much more indicative of what all this code does. So we apply the gravity and then we have the collision take place down below. We really know what all this code is related to in this case. We just need to make sure that we call this dot apply gravity up above within our update method. As long as we do that, everything should still function exactly the same, but our code is going to be much more legible and cleaner in the long run for when we start adding other things like collision detection. But with our nifty new gravity effect, this is going to allow us to head back on over to to do and check off gravity. Next, we're going to cover movement. So whenever we press a key on the keyboard, we either want to move our cube over to the left or over to the right so that we can avoid enemies later on and maybe even add a little bit of movement back and forth in case we want to really spice up our game a bit. So how do we go about adding in movement to our game? Well, to add user input within JavaScript land, we need to add what are called event listeners. Essentially, we're going to listen for an event like a key press and then once that key is pressed, we're going to react to it in some way. And we can react to it in ways such as editing our cube's velocity so that we can go to the left or that we can go to the right. 
And we'll see this very shortly, but it's important to note, we need to use an event's code property when listening for events because there's another property called key and it is case sensitive, meaning if a user has caps lock on and they were to press something like A or D, the event might not register because it is listening for a lowercase a or D. You're going to see what I mean by that shortly, but let's start off easy. Let's add in an event listener that listens for when we press down on our keyboard. So over in our code, I want to go to the very bottom of our page, and I typically always add in event listeners at the very bottom if I'm working in one singular file. So I'm actually going to do this right above animate just so you guys can see it on the screen recording. And to add an event listener, I want to select the window object. This is an object that is set for us thanks to the browser, it provides all these different properties related to our browser window. And one of those properties or method per se is going to be add event listener. Looks something like that. So this is going to take two arguments. The first is going to be what event do we want to listen for? Well, I want to listen for a key down event, all one word. So now whenever we press down on our keyboard, we should register some sort of action. But how do we denote what action should occur? That's going to be the second argument. So I'll add in a comma and then add in an arrow function like so. So whenever we press down on the keyboard, we're going to call whatever code is inside of this arrow function. Now this arrow function takes an argument by default, and it's going to be an event argument. It's going to contain all the properties related to that one specific event which has occurred, such as let's say I press down on my spacebar. The event object is going to have all the information related to that spacebar press down event, including what key was pressed, when it was pressed, and so forth. So let's log out this event object with console log event, just so I can show you exactly what I mean by this. If I save this, refresh, and then open up our console, you're going to see I already have a couple keyboard events going on over here, but let me just press spacebar after selecting our scene. I hit spacebar and we have that one keyboard event. If I open this on up, we have all these different properties related to that one event, but the one we want to focus on is going to be a code of space. This is going to stay the same no matter if caps lock is on or off. But if we were to focus on key and press something like F, let me go ahead and do that now. I'm going to press F on the keyboard. We're going to have a whole new event at the very bottom. I'll make sure you can see that, there it is. So you can see right here, I pressed F and caps lock is off. So it is lowercase, but you can see right here, our code is still key uppercase F. That's exactly what I want because watch what happens when I hit caps lock, select our scene, press F again. We're going to have a new keyboard event. I open that up. And this key is different, it's an uppercase F, which means if we were to register this and listen for that one uppercase F or one lowercase F, well, things just wouldn't work as expected. It would only work either if caps lock is on or off, but if we use code, this is exactly the same no matter if it's uppercase or not. So that's a really specific use case, but it's going to help your games later on to make sure that they work for all users, whether they have caps lock on or off. So we want to monitor for certain keys within this event listener. The keys that I want to use to move our cube around the scene are going to be A and D. Those are pretty standard for moving something to the left and to the right using video games, using your left hand. So how do I listen for just those specific keys within this event listener and then react to them in some way? Well, I'm going to use a switch case statement like so, and I want to switch out our event object, but specifically the event dot code property. And I want to listen for whether or not there is a case in which event.code is equal to something like key A, uppercase A. And if it is, we're going to call the following code in between this case statement and this break statement. Let's console log out some text that says we pressed down A to make sure this is working. But I also want to listen for when we press down our D key. So I'm going to copy this case paste in a second one, and make sure that we're listening for a key of D instead. And if we press down D, which can't slug out the text, we pressed down D. We'll save that, refresh, and now when I press A on the keyboard, we're going to can't slug that text, we press down A. If I press D, we press down D, caps lock is on, still works for both, but if I press any other key like M, N, B, H, J, K, L, we're not going to see anything logged because we're not reacting to those keys. We're really only saying listen for A and D because that's what we want to use to move our player from left to right. So now that this is working, how would we actually move our player? 
Well, we want to change our player's velocity on the x-axis. How do we do that? Well, simple enough. Whenever we press down a key of A, that means we're moving over to the left. So let's select our player, which is actually going to be, what did we call it? A simple cube const. So we'll grab the cube and then set its velocity on the x-axis equal to negative one, meaning it's going to go over to the left. And negative one might actually be a little too fast. Let's set it equal to something like 0 0.01 instead and see what happens. Let's save, refresh, I'll exit out of the console and then press A. Nothing is happening, even though I promise you we are setting this property right here, velocity.x. We need to tell our class how it should react when a velocity on the x-axis is set. I believe right now we're only doing it for the y-axis. So let's find that cube class. It's going to be up above, right here on line 40. It's actually called box. And we already have a velocity property being passed through with an x, y, and z equal to zero. You can see that is set right here. But within update, we're really only updating our y velocity and then editing our y position off of that. So we've only done something with y. We need to do something with both x and even z if we'd like to add that in. So right above apply gravity, I'm going to take this dot position dot x. And I'm going to say we're going to add on to this whatever our velocity is on the x axis. So when we press down A, this is going to be set equal to negative 0.01. And if we add a negative value onto this dot position dot x, it should be shifting our cube over to the left whenever we call update, which we know we are. So let's save this, refresh. And now when I press A, you can see that's moving over to the left, but it's not actually falling down. And eventually we're going to code that in with some additional collision detection, but this is a good start to get our cube moving. Now let's get it moving over to the right. So to move this over to the right, well, we already have our position x set to be edited by our velocity, no matter if it's negative or positive. But I want it to be positive when I press down our D key, which occurs right here within our new switch case statement. So I'm going to get rid of our console log and then select cube.velocity.x. And I'm going to make this a positive value, so 0.01 instead. And that should shift our cube over to the right whenever I press down our D key. So we'll save that, refresh, and now when I press D, we are moving to the right. And when I press A, we are moving back to the left. But you'll notice, as I move around, I lift up both hands off the keyboard, yet we're still moving. We need to stop eventually. So there are a few ways to do this, but I found that the best way is to use a keys object that monitors for whether or not a key is pressed down directly within our animation loop. That is the most responsive way I've found. So here's how we're going to do it. We're going to create a const right above our event listener. And this is going to be called keys. It's an object that has all the keys that we want to listen for, whether or not we press them down. So the first key we want to listen for is A. It's going to be an object that has a pressed property. So is A pressed at any point in time? By default, it's not going to be pressed. And then we want one more property, one more key, and it's going to be our D key. Is that pressed by default when we first load our game? No, it is not, so we'll set that equal to false. So now that I have this keys object, what I'm going to do is head inside our event listener where we're monitoring for key down events. And I'm not going to change our velocity directly in here. I'm going to get rid of this. And then say, whenever we press down our A key, our keys.a object, specifically the pressed property, is going to be set to equal to true. So we know it is currently pressed when we press down our A key. We want to do the same thing for our D key. So I'll copy this line, delete the cube velocity setting, and then say, instead of keys a.pressed, I want to monitor for keys d.pressed and set that equal to true. So now these properties will be set equal to true when we press down our keyboard, but we want to set them to false when we lift up on the keys. And to do that, we need one more event listener. It's going to look almost exactly the same, but we're going to change three very specific properties. So I'm going to take this whole event listener statement, copy it and paste it beneath the one we have currently, and the properties that are going to change are going to be this right here, the event we're listening for. I don't want to listen for a key down event anymore, but rather a key up event. So whenever we lift up on a key, we're going to call the following code. And if the key we lift up on is key A, we're going to set keys.a.pressed not equal to true, but equal to false instead. We're going to do the same thing for our D key. If we ever lift up on our D key, we're going to set this equal to false. So now we have a really robust way to track whether or not a key is pressed down and whether or not it's lifted up. And we can use that within our animation loop to actually move our cube from the left and to the right. How do we go about doing that? Well, before I call cube.update, I'm going to add in our movement code. 
And here's how we're going to move our cube. I'm going to say if keys.a is pressed, then we're going to select our cube, get its velocity on the x-axis, and set this equal to negative 0.01. That's going to move it over to the left. But else if keys.d is pressed, so if our d key is pressed down, we're going to take the cube velocity on the x-axis and set it to 0 0.01, the positive value. Now this is pretty much exactly what we had before, but the difference is going to be, before we set any of this, I'm going to set cube velocity.x equal to zero for every frame we go through. So no matter what frame we go through, cube velocity x will be set to zero, meaning we cannot move at all. But if one key is pressed down, we go onto the next line, such as this, and we're going to set our x velocity equal to negative 0 0.01. If the d key is pressed, we're going to set that equal to 0 0.01. This means we can go back and forth, or when we lift up on the keys, we're going to stop completely, because for every frame, we are setting this equal to zero. That's how this whole thing works. So let's save, refresh, and see this in action. If I hold down on the A key, we move to the left, but if I lift up, we stop. Perfect. If I hold down on the D key, we move to the right. You'll see, I lift up and we stop. So that is pretty much how we add movement to our game, at least a really basic rudimentary version of movement. If you would like to move back and forth on the z-axis, it's pretty much the same exact thing. We're going to be listening for different keys like W and S, and then you just want to make sure within your code up here, your box class, that you are adding on tier Z velocity within update. So let's just do that just so I can show you how it's done in case you want to add that extra dimension because this is a 3D game, you know. So I'm going to take our position on the z-axis and add on to it our velocity on the z-axis. With that there, I have the ability to edit that z velocity whenever we listen for a different key down. So on key down, instead of listening for a D key, I can listen for a key of S, and then say that our keys S property dot pressed will be equal to true. I want to do the same thing for our W key. So if the case is W, our keys W property pressed will be equal to true. But currently S and W do not exist, so I'll add those keys in right here. We'll say this isn't D, but rather S, and then instead of D, we also have a W key now, which is up, essentially. All those are going to be equal to false to start, but whenever we key up, we need to make sure that we set those new properties of S and W back equal to false. So I'll grab those two cases, paste them in, make sure that I'm setting these two values equal to false for whenever we lift up on either the S or the W key. And now we just need to determine what happens when either S or W is pressed, which we can do right here within these if else if statements. So if we want to clean this up a little bit, we currently only have one line of code being ran within each if statement, which means we can get rid of the curly brackets and make what would be five lines right here, only two. This is totally valid code and it's a lot easier to read as well. So now if we want to add in the S and W keys, we can copy this else if statement, paste it twice, and then say I want to listen for S, I want to listen for W, see if those are pressed, and then if S is pressed, we're going to change our velocity on the z-axis equal to a positive value, that means we're going to be coming in towards us, and then when we press W, I want to change the velocity on the z-axis equal to a negative value, that means we should be going further out. So as long as we've done all this correctly, we will save, refresh, and now watch what happens when I press W on the keyboard. We are heading out, away, and then if I hit S, we're coming back towards us. If I hold down D, we are moving. But you'll notice I have the same issue as before on the Z-axis, where if I press W, we just keep going even though I've lifted up on the keyboard. So that just means we have some sort of issue here, and it's right here. We never actually set our Q velocity on the Z-axis back to zero for every frame. We're currently only doing it for the X-axis. So we can just simply copy and paste a new line and make sure that we're monitoring for our Q velocity on the Z-axis and change that equal to zero. So we do that, save, and refresh. Now, when I press W on the keyboard, we move forward, I lift up, we stop. Hit S, we move back, lift up, we stop. Hit D, we move to the right, and then hit A, we move to the left. But you might notice that if I try pressing both of these at the same time, let's just say W and D, well, I can't really go in a diagonal motion because these are all embedded within the same else if block. So if I wanna make those two axes independent of one another, then I can get rid of an else if right here when we're monitoring for S and W, and just make that an if else if. 
So now these two are going to be monitored independent from one another, which means that this can be true right here and this can be true. So this is our Z axis, this is our X axis. We can move on either one at the same time as long as we separate them. So we save, refresh, and now I can hold down W and D and you'll see we're moving diagonally. Same with W and A, same with A and S, and then same with D and S. So some pretty cool movement code right here that can add a lot of dynamic ability to your game. But I think with this right here, we're going to be able to go back to to do and check off movement. So we're able to move around our screen freely, but you'll notice something. If we try to go off the edge of our platform over here to the right, left, up, or down, that we actually don't fall down, even though we probably should. This doesn't really make much sense when we look at this from a visual perspective. We want to make sure that our cube falls down when we go off the platform. How do we go about coding that? Well, we're going to need a little bit more math right here. So what we need to do is compare these two rectangular prisms that we have here. We're going to compare our green cube to this blue platform, which is also a box. So how do we begin comparing these? Well, the first thing I want to do is compare the left and right sides of both of these rectangular prisms. So when I look at the right side of our cube, I'm going to rotate over here. It's this black side right now, the one that's covered with a shadow. And same thing goes for our platform. The right side of our platform is also this darker shade. And I also want to compare for the left side of both of these. If I go over to the left, both of these have this darker shade associated with them. But I'm going to focus on one side for each rectangular prism at a time. So let me move this cube over to the left of our platform. What I want to do is get the X position of our cube, specifically for the right face of this cube. So I want to get the X position of wherever this right hand face is. So I'm going to get that, but then I want to get the left position of this blue platform. And to get that, we need to get whatever this X value is, but we're only going to be getting this on the X axis. We don't need to focus on the Z axis. We don't need to focus on the Y axis. Right now, I just solely want to get the X values of the right side of our cube and the left side of our blue box right here. And what we're going to do is once we get those values, we're going to compare them against each other. We're going to say is the right side of our cube right here greater than or equal to the left side of our blue box. And if it is greater than, meaning we are over here, let me move the box over. If it is greater than, then we know the two are colliding on the X axis, at least from the right side of our green cube. So let's start very simple and detect for a collision with the right face of our green cube and the left face of our blue box. So how would I go about getting that right face side on the X axis for our green cube? Well, I'm going to want to find where we declare our class and it's up here all the way on line 40 for me. And we know right now we're assigning a bottom and top whenever we create a new box. That is great, but I also want to create a left and a right to indicate what the left position is and what the right position is for each box we create. So right above our bottom and top, I'm going to create a new property called this dot right. And this dot right is going to be equal to this dot position dot X. And then we want to add on one half of our cubes width. So we'll add on this dot width divided by two. Because if you think about it, going back over here, let me refresh real quick. If we want to get the right side of our green cube, what do we need to do? Well, we're going to start from the center on the X axis, and this is position X right here. Then we need to add onto this one half of the width, which is going to be this value. We add that on and we're going to get the right side of our cube right. So that's how this is working. If we want to get the left side, we do essentially the same thing, but we're going to subtract this dot width divided by two instead. So I'll say this dot left is equal to this dot position dot X. That gives us the center on the X axis. And then I want to subtract this dot width divided by two. So now we have the right and left coordinates for our green cube and actually also our blue box as well because the blue box is also utilizing the same box class. Since both utilize the same class, both are going to have a right and a left property assigned to them, which now we can begin using for collision detection on the X axis. So how would we begin detecting for collision? Well, let's go on over to update. And right before I apply gravity, I'm going to detect for collision on the X 
axis to start. So remember, when I was showing you this example over here, we wanted to compare the right side of our green cube to the left side of our ground. How do we go about doing that? Well, I would write an if statement that says if this dot right, this in this case is going to represent our green cube. So we have the right value right here. And then I want to say, is this greater than or equal to the left side of our ground? We don't actually have the ground available to us. I might have misspelled this right here. I think I put group instead of ground. So I want to make sure that I'm passing through our ground within this update function. I'm going to do that now. And then I want to say if the right side of the cube is greater than or equal to the left side of our ground, then we know there's going to be a collision on the x axis. But before we actually test this, we always need to make sure that we are updating the new right and left position within our update method. Otherwise, this is only going to be called once when we initially create the boxes. We want to make sure it's called for every frame, which we know we're calling within update. So what we can do is we can copy these two lines and then go inside of our update method and paste them in. And now they should be updated accordingly. But adding these two additional lines in, it's making our code a little muddy, a little harder to understand. As a result, this is a good instance in which we might want to refactor this into a separate function to better clarify what these lines of code do. So right above update, I'm going to add in another method. And this is going to be called update sides. And what does update sides do? Well, it runs these four lines of code. So I'll cut them out of update, paste them into update sides. And now whenever I call update, what can I do? I can call this dot update sides instead. And this is a lot more clear than just using these four lines in line within the update method. So for every frame, we know that we're updating our sides. And then if the right side of our cube is greater than or equal to the left side of our ground, we should console log out this text. Let's save, refresh. And right now we're logging this out because we can see the right side of the green cube is definitely past the left side of the blue ground. But if I go off to the left, we're no longer logging that out. You'll see it stops as soon as the right side of the green cube passes this section right here. But as soon as I cross that line, it starts over again. That is great. That is beginning to 3D collision detection, but we've only done one side. We need to take into account the five other sides to make sure that we have full collision detection. And then we can react to this in a specific way by making our cube fall or something along the lines of that. But watch what happens first when I take our cube off the right side of our platform. You're going to see that this is still logging out even though we just dealt with some of the x-axis. Now what we need to do is take into account the left side of our cube right here. So the left side of our cube and see is the left side of our cube less than or equal to the right side of our ground. If it is, we know they are colliding from those faces. So let's add that in. We have our first conditional here, but I also want to test for by adding an and operator for if this dot the left, the left side of the green cube is less than or equal to the right side of our ground. And as long as we add that in there, now we're only going to log this out as long as our cube is actually colliding with our ground on the x-axis. So you'll see we're definitely logging that out. I go over to the right. No longer logging that out, it stops. But if I go back over, once again, we're logging it. And if I go all the way over to the left, it stops once it passes on the x-axis. That is perfect. That is exactly what we want. But now we need to take into account the other sides. So let's move on to the z-axis next. To add collision detection for the z-axis, what do we need? Well, we need a front and we need a back. We don't have that declared currently. As you can see, we have a right, left, bottom, and top. So let's add in those additional properties. I'm going to get the front face by saying this dot front is equal to this dot position dot z. And then I want to add on this dot depth divided by two. And that should give us the front face. But now I need the back face. So I'll say this dot back is equal to this dot position dot z, which is also in the center. And then I need to subtract our depth divided by two. And that should give us the back value correctly. Now I want to make sure these are always updated for every frame. So I'll copy these two lines, paste them within update sides, which in return is going to be called right here. So we should always have updated front and back values. Now to detect for a collision with the z-axis, we're going to extend this conditional. What I could do is add in an and statement that does exactly that. So what I'll say is if this dot front is greater than or equal to our grounds back, then we know the two are colliding on z-axis. 
but we also need to take into account the opposite faces. So I'll say if this dot back is less than or equal to the ground dot front, they are definitely colliding on z-axis. So looking at these conditionals, it might get a little confusing later on. You might have trouble remembering what exactly these do, even though it's not too complicated. So what I like doing here is taking groupings of these conditions. So let's say I want to take the front and the back. I'm going to cut these out right here. And right above this if statement, I'm going to create a const that says z collision. Is there a collision on the z axis? And then I'm going to assign to this the conditional. This is going to equate to true or false. But now I can use it within this if statement. So I can say if there is a z collision along with an x collision with these two statements, then we're going to log out the following. And now this shouldn't just be collision on the x-axis, but collision on x and z. So let's do the same thing for these two conditionals right here to clean up our code. I'll cut them out of place, create a new const called x collision, and assign that to the conditional I just cut out, where we compare the right and the left, and we don't need this tail end and statement. So I'll say if there is an x collision, and there is a z collision, then we're going to log out this text right here. Let's test things out to make sure things work. I'll save, refresh. There is definitely a collision on the x and z axis, but I'm going to move off our z end over here. And once I move off fully, we're going to stop logging that out. Perfect. That side definitely works. Let's make sure that our x axis still works. Indeed it does. I'll zoom out a bit by scrolling. And then once we go off this end right here, we should stop logging out that text. It works perfectly. And then one more side over here. All right, so that is looking great. What I want to do next is detect for no other than the y-axis. Because although we don't really need it right now, based on the way we already added some collision detection with our full scene ground, we will need it later on to detect for a collision when we add enemies into our game. So let's start adding that in. We already have a bottom and a top. That is absolutely perfect. But now I need to create a const that detects for whether or not we have some sort of y collision. So I'm going to create that const, call it y collision, and set this equal to no other than if this dot bottom. So let's imagine this. Does the bottom of our green cube pass into the top of our blue ground? So is the bottom less than or equal to our ground dot top? If so, we know they're colliding from the bottom of our green cube and the top of our blue ground. But I want an AND statement that tracks for the opposite sides on the y-axis. So if this dot top, the top of our green cube, if that is a greater than or equal to value than our ground dot bottom, they should be colliding on the y-axis from that face. So now we just need to take this y collision and add in one more AND statement. So we're detecting for x, y, and z. And as long as there's a collision on any of those, we're going to log out this right here. Refresh, and you're going to see, well, we're not logging that out anymore, even though there definitely were some collisions right there that caused our box to bounce back up. And the reason it's not registering is because we're taking into account our Y collision right here with this statement, but we're going to replace that very shortly with this new collision detection code that we just wrote. So it's likely that we don't really know what this does if we come back to it and look at it. Maybe we do because we're super smart, but in this case, sometimes it would take me a lot of mental power to understand exactly what this does. And if that's ever the case, it's a great sign that you might want to refactor this. And I might want to use this elsewhere, not just within my class of box. So as a result, I'm going to take all these lines right here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a utility function down below called box collision. And inside of box collision, I'm going to paste in that code and we're going to refactor things a bit so that we can use this anywhere. Now I want to test for box collision between what? Two boxes. If that's the case, I'm going to add in one argument right here. It's going to be a simple object that has two properties. The first property is going to be box one. That's the first box I want to detect for collision with. And the second is going to be box two, the second box. Makes sense, right? And now that we have these boxes being passed through to detect for a collision, instead of using something like this, we're going to replace all instances of this with box one, the first box that we want to detect for a collision with. And now we're no longer going to compare just a standard ground value, but rather the second box that we're passing in. So we'll replace all instances of ground right here with no other than box two. 
And now we have a very reusable function compared to prior. We can get rid of this comment, and we're not just going to use this if statement to determine whether or not two boxes are colliding. Rather, we're going to return the value of all three of these conditions. So we're going to return whether or not there is an x, y, and z collision. And if all of them equate to true, then we know that there is a collision between the two boxes that we're comparing for right here. So now, where do we want to actually use this function that we just created? Well, right now we're testing if we hit the ground with our box with this condition right here. If the bottom of our box is less than or equal to our ground top, then we know there's a collision, we bounce our box, and we apply friction. We're no longer going to do things this way. I'm going to take out this if statement and then say if there is a box collision instead. And this takes one argument, but it has two properties inside of the object, which are going to be box one. What should box one be? What is the first object in which we want to detect for collision with? Well, this. This is going to represent the green cube. But what is the second thing we want to detect for collision with? It's going to be box two, set equal to the ground that we pass through. But right now, we don't actually have ground available to us because within apply gravity, we don't actually have an argument which passes a ground through. So I'll make sure to define that I want to pass through a ground as the first argument. And now that we have ground already passed through our update method, we can also pass it through apply gravity, making sure that it's available to us right here. So now what we're saying is if box collision equates to true, then we're going to bounce our box upwards, apply friction, else we're going to keep pulling our box downwards. So we're just using a different way to detect for a collision right here, but it's going to take into account all three dimensions in which we can travel. So let's save and refresh and see how things look. So immediately you're going to notice that we're not bouncing back up like you might think we should. And yeah, that is incorrect, but let's move off to the side real quick just to see if we actually fall. Not falling just yet. You'll see there's a little issue right there. We have a little bit of overlap, not too good, but if I move completely off the side, now we fall off the platform. That is pretty close to what we want, but we want to fix this right here, where we actually go inside of the blue platform. We need to take into account, we're applying a Y velocity to our position at all times. And if we're not applying that Y velocity to our collision detection code, well, we're just going to go and collide into the box. And if we set our position so that we're inside the box, when we reverse our velocity, it's not going to let us back out of it. It's just going to reverse the velocity back and forth really quickly. So what we want to do is when we're using box collision right here, when we're falling down, we want to make sure that we take into account the Y velocity being applied by gravity. So let's see, box one dot bottom. That is going to be the bottom of box one, the green box essentially. I wanna make sure that I'm always adding onto this value, box one's velocity on the Y axis, because we know gravity is going to be applied there. And as long as we do that, we're essentially going to be predicting whether or not we're about to collide with the blue box. And if we are about to collide, then that is when we're going to call whatever code is inside of here. We're going to reverse the velocity. We're not actually going to push our green box into the blue one. We're just going to hop up as soon as we register that collision. So I save that and refresh. You can see we have our bouncing back. And now when I move off to the side, we don't have that overlap anymore. That is absolutely perfect. That is what we want. But I don't want to fully go off the side. We already tested that. Instead, let's test out the bottom side right here. I'm going to slowly snail my way over there. And once I go off the very edge, you'll see that we fall down back into the depths. So let's test out the side on the left and the side on the top, and that is a little slow for me, so if you wanna make your character faster when you key down, remember, we determined that right here within animate. So this is our value for how fast we travel. If I wanna change this and make it a little quicker, I can do something like 0 0.05 instead. We'll save that, refresh, and now if I go off the top side, we just fall straight down, and if I go off to the left, we fall straight down as well. So pretty cool stuff right here with collision detection. And the cooler thing is that this is going to work for when we produce other enemies. We can use this same code that we wrote because we wrote that nice little function with other enemies and other rectangular prisms on the screen. So when one of our enemies hits us, we're going to call it game over and our game and that'll be the end of this and the tutorial, I guess. But that's pretty good for collision detection. I think that's all we need to know for the time being. So let's go back on over to our to-do list and check off full collision detection. So next on the list is going to be enemy spawning, but I'm actually going to make a quick change up here. I want to start with the end game scenario first because I figured it would be easier to deal with just one enemy before we go spawning multiple ones in them. So yes, 
Technically, we are going to be spawning one enemy, but eventually we'll get to the multiple. So let's start with our end game scenario. How do we end our game? And I guess, how do we even really create our game if we don't have any enemies yet? Well, we want to create at least one enemy on the screen. And we're going to create things in a way that provides for expansion so that we can create multiple enemies in the next episode. So how do we go about doing this? Well, I'm going to head on over to where we have our function of animate. And what I want to do is create a const called enemies. And this is going to be equal to a simple array. So this is going to be responsible for housing all of our enemy objects. What is an enemy in this case? Well, it's just going to be another box, probably a different color. So let's make our first enemy just one simple red box on our screen. If I want to create a simple box, the easiest thing to do is find out where we're creating our first box. That's going to be our hero cube which we declared up here, it's on line 126 for me, where we are creating a new box. I want to take all this code all the way down to scene.addCube and head back on down to where we declared this enemy's const. So right up above this, I'm going to paste in all those lines of code and I need to make sure that I change this value right here from cube to something else. I think it makes sense in this case to change it to enemy because that is what this represents. This one singular box right here. And then I want to make sure that our enemies can cast a shadow. So I'll set this equal to true. And then I want to add this enemy to the scene. And what I'm going to do is add this enemy to our enemies array to start. So we can begin expanding things later on. But one key thing here is I want to make sure that this enemy has a different color from our green cube and our blue platform. So I'm going to make this color to start at least red because red is evil. And as they say these days, so color for our enemy is red. We can just put in a string like this. It takes CSS value. So really cool stuff right there with making our enemy red. Yes, this will add our enemy to the scene if we save and refresh, but you're going to see it's not updated like our green hero cube is. So what I want to do is make sure that for every enemy within our enemy's array, I want to call the dot update method that we created for our box class. So to do that, right beneath or right above, doesn't really matter where, Let's do right beneath. Right beneath where we're updating our cube, I want to select our enemies array, the one we just created. And I'm going to call an array for each method on top of that. What this does is it says, for each enemy within the array, call the following code. So the first argument is going to be the enemy we're looping over, and this is going to be an arrow function. So now that I'm looping over every enemy within our enemies array, I can select that enemy object and call no other than update. But remember, our update method takes ground as an argument because we're using that for collision detection for when our boxes fall down towards the platform. So I need to make sure that I'm passing that through right here. If I save and refresh, now our enemy is bouncing along with our green hero cube, but it is overlapping on top of the green cube. We want to make sure that we can see both of them to make sure everything's working at the same time. So what I'm going to do is find where we're creating our first enemy and then change its position. I don't really need to edit its velocity just yet, but I will later on and you'll see that shortly. So I'll make sure that I add in a new position property. And position is going to have an X. I'll set that equal to zero to start. A Y also equal to zero and then a Z. So I want this pushed further back in the scene. That means I need to use a negative value here. Let's try something like negative four and see where that lands. Save that and refresh. And now you can see we have two separate boxes. We have the cube in which we can control. And then we have our enemy box over here, which is just standing there for the time being. Now, what I want to happen is have our enemies go towards the end of our platform until they fall off with the attempt to hit us as we move back and forth. If we move out of the way, then we're going to say, hey, we did a good job, more enemies can spawn. But if one enemy does hit us, that's when we're going to end our game. So the whole point of the game is just dodge the enemies as they continuously spawn and get faster and faster. So we want our enemy to be traveling on the Z axis towards the beginning of our platform. And we can do this very easily because we already set up our Z velocity for our box class. Remember, we can move on the Z axis and the X axis. So what I want to do is find our enemy. We already have it right here. And then we can set our Y velocity equal to zero because that's going to be affected by gravity anyways. I want to change our Z velocity instead to make sure that it's moving towards the end of the platform. So Z is going to be equal to something like 0, 0, 5. I want to make sure this is pretty slow because otherwise it's just going to move way too fast. So let's save this. We're setting our Z velocity equal to 0 0.005, which in return should move our enemy box. 
save and refresh, and here comes the enemy. Really slow, but nevertheless, this is a great start. See, as it's about to hit me, I can move out of the way, and this would be a successful scenario in which we can proceed onwards with our game. So the first thing I would do here, I suppose, is monitor for collision. We want to detect when this red box touches our green box and then pause our game altogether, but one thing at a time. Let's monitor for that first initial collision between the two boxes. So to do that, I'm going to find where we're updating our enemy within our animation loop. And then for every frame within our animation loop, I want to use our box collision function to monitor for collision. So I'll say if box collision, if there is a box collision between what two properties? Well, box one, which is going to be equal to our cube, the green cube, and then box two, which will be equal to the enemy we're currently looping over. Like I said, this is setting us up for success when we want to add multiple enemies later on. So we're detecting for a collision between the cube and the enemy, and if there is one, to start, we're going to console log out, collision. We know the two are colliding. Let's make sure that this works. We'll save, refresh, and open up the console. And now, only when the enemy touches the green cube should we see that text. And there it goes. And when it goes off, it's no longer being logged. So there were 400 frames in which we were colliding, but we want to make sure that we stop our game on that initial touch. So here's how you're going to stop things within JavaScript. So request animation frame returns an ID for every frame that we go over. It starts out at zero or one, I can't remember which one, doesn't really matter, but let's just say it starts out at one. For every frame, it's going to increase very, very, very quickly. So let's create a const that stores this value. It's going to be animation ID, the ID returned for the current frame we're looping over. If I want to pause our game, I need to call another window.function. It's going to be window.cancelAnimationFrame rather than request animation frame. And that's going to take one argument, and it's going to be the animation ID of the current frame we're looping over. As long as we're calling this on the current frame we're looping over, it's going to stop our animation loop and pause our game completely. So instead of console logging out collision, I'm going to call cancel animation frame. And this is part of the window.object, but if you're ever using the window.object in the first place, you don't actually need to specify window. It just assumes automatically that this is available to us. So I'll use the shorthand version and say cancel the animation frame of the current frame we're looping over which is stored within animation ID. And as long as we have this in place, save and refresh, and our enemy touches us, I'll move forward so it happens a little quicker, things are going to pause and we can no longer play our game or even really zoom around. We might want to continue zooming around, but this is okay for a basic game. I don't want to get too complex here for teaching you guys how to do this, at least not yet. So we're canceling our animation frame. One thing I definitely want to make sure that I note here is your screen might be running at a different frame rate than someone else's screen. My screen right here, I'm using a MacBook Pro. It runs at 120 frames per second, 120 hertz. So really, my game might be running at twice the speed of yours, and you might have noticed like your values don't move your objects as quickly. It's because I'm using a monitor with a high refresh rate. They usually range from 60 hertz to 120 hertz. So if you have a higher hertz value, it's going to make your game quicker than if you have a lower value. As a result, you want to make sure that you either enhance your game based on the frame rate so that everything moves at a constant speed, or you want to limit your frame rate so it doesn't run past anything like 60 frames per second. I have both a video tutorial and also a blog post on how to do just that, which I will link right here. So if you want to visit that and see exactly how I do it, then be sure to check out that link. Otherwise, let's continue onwards. So in the end, with that simple collision detection in place, we have an end game scenario, but before we go on to the next lesson where we spawn multiple enemies, I want to add in a nice cool little feature here, and it's going to be Z acceleration for our enemies. So right now, they're moving at a constant rate, which is kind of boring, and it's pretty easy to, I guess, defend against as well. I want them to actually accelerate as they go down the platform. So how would we go about doing that? Well, we need to find where we are adding on to our box's Z position. It's going to be right here. So right after we update our sides, what I'm going to do is say I want this dot velocity on the z-axis to be added onto by a very small amount for every frame. And this is just going to increase the speed at which the boxes move at. But this is going to apply for all moving boxes, including our own player box. I don't really want acceleration on the player box. I just want it on the enemy boxes. 
So we can abstract our class in a way where we specify which boxes get this Z acceleration. To do that, I'm going to add in one additional argument to our constructor, and it's going to be called Z acceleration. By default, it'll be equal to false. So once I declare that as an argument, I want to declare a property that I can use later on that says this dot Z acceleration is equal to the Z acceleration that we passed through as an argument. Perfect. So now what we can do is we can use this within our update method to say we only want to run this line of code that adds the acceleration if that Z acceleration value is equal to true. So let's set that. I'll say if this dot Z acceleration is equal to true, then we can run the following line of code. So finally, in order to make this take effect, what we need to do is declare on our enemies that we want a Z acceleration value. So I'm going to scroll down to where we're creating our enemy, and it's going to be on line 218 for me. And I'll add in a Z acceleration property, make sure I set that equal to true, so that takes effect. So if we've done everything correctly, I save and refresh, we should see our enemy get quicker. And it looks like it's just so fast that uh, it's not really fun there. It's a little hard to actually dodge the enemy. Let's slow it down a bit. I'm going to go back up to our enemy class and make this something like 0 0.0001 instead. Let's see what that looks like. So our enemy is coming in slow, but you can see it's definitely speeding up as it reaches the end. Let's try 0003. And I think I like where that is. That should make our game pretty hard to play, especially if we move our enemies back and increase the length of our platform a bit. So this is getting cool to look at. And as you can see, obviously it works when the two collide, our game stops. Really, all that's left is to create multiple enemies and we're going to do that in the very next episode. So let's head on back to to-do and check off end game scenario. All right, so let's move on to enemy spawning. Right now, of course, we only have one enemy, but we want multiple. It is a pretty boring game to dodge one enemy, see it go off into the depths, and that's the game. We want more than that. So how would we make this more compelling? Well, I think spawning multiple enemies at the end of our platform would be a lot more fun. And also, if we were to speed up these enemies and the rate at which they spawn over time, yeah, that's a lot more interesting than just this one enemy coming at us. So how would we create multiple enemies in the first place? What is the idea behind that? Well, we need to spawn enemies at a certain rate. We're going to do this by using our frame rate. So we don't really have a way to track what frame we're on, except I suppose the animation ID. But let's say we wanted to change this frame rate or set it back to zero at a specific point in time. In that case, it makes sense to make a frames let. So let frames is equal to zero. And then at the very end of each frame within animate, we can add one onto the current frame we're on. So this is another way to track which frame we're on and we're going to use it to spawn more enemies. But how do we spawn more enemies dynamically? Well, what we want to do is say, after let's say 30 frames have passed, we want to push a new enemy into our enemy's array. And whenever we push a new enemy into our enemy's array, by default, they're going to be rendered out and updated because we're always looping through each of the enemies within our enemy's array. So we already have all that set up, it's really easy. All we need to do now is determine when do we want to spawn these enemies and how do we push them into our array. So let's say if frames, the current frame we're on, divided, and note we're using a modulo operator here. If the remainder of frames divided by 30 is equal to zero, meaning there is no remainder, then what do we want to do? We want to take our enemy's array and push in a new enemy. So what does an enemy consist of? Well, all this box code right here that we already declared. I'm going to copy an enemy, and actually, I'll take this whole thing. I'm going to take that whole statement. And within this if statement we just wrote, I'm going to create that new enemy const. I want to make sure that it casts a shadow, and I also want to make sure that I'm adding it to the scene when this value is true. And then we are going to push in a new enemy into our enemy's array. So really, we don't even need this initial enemy creation to start because it's going to be happening for every 30th frame. So let's get rid of const enemy, get rid of these two lines as well. And now all we have is this enemy's array, but we don't have an enemy anymore, so let's get rid of that. We just have an array to store enemies, then we render them out, and for every 30th frame, we're going to push in a new enemy. So let's save this and see if we did things correctly. Refresh. And yeah, it looks like we did things correctly, but that is way too many enemies. <laughs> and if I immediately crash into one, we're just going to lose our game altogether. So we need to slow the rate in which these enemies are spawning. 
Right now it's for every 30th frame. I think it makes more sense to do maybe every 200th instead. Really slow these down. Let's save and refresh. And I think that is a much better rate. So this is still a very easy game. The enemy doesn't have any randomization in regards to where they are spawned on the x-axis. We want these spawned all the way from over here to the right side of our platform. So how would we go about doing that? Well, right now we have an X position and it's always set equal to zero. That just means the enemy is spawned right in the center of the screen. But we want this to be variable. So to make this variable, I'm going to call a function called math.random. This gets any value from zero to one randomly. But if I subtract from this 0 0.5, now what this is going to do together is it's going to get any random value negative 0.5 to 0.5. How does that work? Well, if math.random is supplying any value, 0 to 1, we can get something like 0.4, or we can get something like 0.8. These are two possible values from math.random. Now watch what happens when I subtract 0.5. Subtract 0.5 from 0.4, what do we get? We get a negative 0.1. And we do the same thing for 0.8, we subtract negative 5, what do we get? we get a positive 0.3. So what this does is it allows us to get either a positive or a negative value because we are subtracting 0.5 from 0 to 1. And we want the ability to be negative or positive because when we move towards the left of our center on the x-axis, those are negative values. But when we move towards the right, those are positive values. So if we're trying to determine a random position, it's very important that we use math random minus 0.5 because we want to be either placed on the left or to the right of our center. So that's a good start, but now we want to make sure that this is multiplied by a larger value. So if we were to multiply, let's say 0.5 by 10, that's the max value by the way, then we would get a x position of five, and that should be able to fit within the bounds of our ground depending on how big it is. So let's just test that out. And then I'm going to make sure that this right here is called before we multiply anything. So I'm wrapping that in parentheses. And with this, we should see some randomization on the x-axis for enemies when they're spawned. So let's refresh, and yeah, that's looking really good. As you can see, they are spawned all over the place. We should get some negative values over here. I think we're just getting unlucky, and yeah, we were. And I like the way that is looking. So cool. But this doesn't really make our game too much harder. I think something that would make this game harder is to increase the rate at which these are spawned the longer the game goes on. So to do that, we need to change this value right here. This is currently our spawn rate. So to clarify this, right above our animation loop, right beneath frames, I'm going to create a let called spawn rate. And we know that is equal to 200. So for every 200th frame, that is our spawn rate. What we want to do is decrease this every time we create that new enemy. So that means our enemies are going to spawn quicker and quicker for the more enemies that we dodge within our game. So it will say as long as our spawn rate is greater than 20, meaning we can't spawn enemies any quicker than at 20 frames per second. We're going to take that spawn rate and subtract from it 20 frames. So for each enemy spawned, they're going to spawn 20 frames quicker than the prior one until we get all the way up to a frame rate of 20 frames per spawn. So let's see what this looks like. We'll save, refresh, there goes the first one. There goes a second, and yeah, these are definitely spawning a lot quicker than before. And it almost gets to the point where it's impossible. So in this case, it would make sense to either large in our platform or add in some sort of jump functionality where we can jump over these additional enemies. But I think this is a good start and probably where I would leave off on for spawning enemies. In the next episode, you'll see I snuck one more task in there, and it is going to be fine tuning. We're going to want to be able to do things like enlarge our platform, choose some colors that actually look good, and then add in some jump functionality. So with enemy spawning complete, let's check it off. So finally, I want to do some fine tuning. I want to spawn enemies further back so we have more of a chance to dodge them. I want to enlarge our platform and maybe even change the colors a bit to make everything more cohesive. So first thing first, let's start by spawning our enemies further back because right now they're spawning way too close to us. And it doesn't really give us much of a chance to survive once things start going quickly. So to move our enemies, we're going to go into our code, find where enemies are being spawned, which is of course right here. And I want to take their Z position, which right now is negative four. 
and change it to a larger value, at least in the negative sense. So I'm going to increase that to negative 20, save and refresh, and you'll see your enemies are being spawned way out there, which is actually what I want. But in order for these to fall on the platform and come at us at a certain speed, we need to enlarge the platform, of course. So how would I enlarge the platform? Well, let's find where we actually create our platform. It is going to be right here on line 144. So right now we have a width of five. Let's enlarge this a little bit to give us more room to breathe. And then I want to really enlarge our depth because our boxes are falling way out there. I'm going to increase this to a value of 50. And yeah, that might be right on the money. So those are spawning right at the end over there. We're already making our game a lot easier to play by putting them way, way, way out there. So as you can see, it's a lot easier to dodge things, but what else would I do to enhance this game? I think one thing I would really do is change the color of everything because it's really jarring. We have this black background, which is kind of depressing. So I think the first thing I would do is change the platform color to something that is not a brightest blue. I don't want to just use straight RGB values. I want to use something a little more eye friendly, I would say. So the first thing I'm going to do is change our color for the platform by getting rid of the old one. I'm going to paste in this hexadecimal value that I already found. So this is just a certain shade of blue that I went into a color wheel to find. I just chose something that I thought looked good to the eye, but wasn't as jarring as that deep blue color we got by default when using just 0000, 000, 000 FF. So that value is 0369A1. You can use this as well if you'd like. Save and refresh. And you can see that already looks a lot more pleasant to the eye, at least in my opinion. It all comes down to taste in the end, right? So it is a little dark for me and I want to brighten this up. And I think the best way to brighten this is to use another light. And we're going to use an ambient light. We haven't used it yet, but we did reference it very quickly within the portion of lights. So add in an ambient light. What I want to do is call scene.add. And I'm going to add this light directly in here by declaring I want a new three ambient light. And remember, an ambient light lights up everything. There is no direction with it, but it will light up parts of our scene to make it seem brighter. It takes two arguments. The first is going to be the color of the light. I just wanted a pure white, which we can get with 0x, f, 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 f. And then how bright do we want this light on a scale of 0 to, I think, infinity? Well, usually the scale is 0 to 1. I want it at a brightness of 0.5, not too bright, but add a little bit of light to everything on the scene. Let's save that and refresh, and yeah, that's already brightened up a lot across the board. But I think the front of our cubes are a little too bright, and part of that is because of our directional light, where it is placed. If I refresh, zoom out really quickly before we die, our directional light right now is placed somewhere up here, and it is shining downwards at everything. I want to move this light a little higher up, so a lot of that light is focused on the top of our cubes rather than the very front, where we don't really see much shading going on from the fronts of our cubes that are being spawned. So to move that, I'm going to decrease our Z value to one instead of two. And if I do that, yeah, I think that is a lot better for the front side of our cues where we're actually looking at. It's not too bright and not too jarring. We have some nice shading going on with the sides of our cues as well. So next, I wanna get rid of this dark depressing background. How do we get rid of the default black background that 3JS provides? Well, to do this, we actually want to go and find our render wherever we created it. And for me, that's going to be on line 33. When we create a new render, this takes an argument. It's going to be an object, but it has multiple properties inside of it that we can basically alter. So the argument that I want to alter is going to be an alpha value. And this can be either true or false. If we set it equal to true, it just means that the background is not going to exist by default. We're only going to use the background that's associated with our actual HTML page. So essentially it says, get rid of everything in the background, only show our 3D objects, but still, for the background, show whatever color is associated with the actual HTML elements. So let's set alpha not equal to one, actually. It's true or false. So alpha to true, refresh, and you can see that we have that nice white background because that is the background associated with our HTML page. We're going to change that very shortly. But one more thing I want to change here is if we look really closely, we have some jaggedness on our cubes, and we can get rid of that by setting one more property while we're here within our WebGL render. That property is going to be anti-alias. I want to set that equal to true. What this is going to do is get rid of that jaggedness and make everything look really sharp and clear. So watch what happens when I save. 
refresh, you should see a notable difference in regards to the jaggedness of your cube. There is no more jaggedness because we're anti-aliasing things. Just means smooth things out, blur them, get rid of any jaggedness that might occur when rendering this. So next, let's change this background color from white to something else. To change that, all I need to do is change our CSS, specifically for our body. I'm going to declare that our background should be equal to this hexadecimal value. This is another one that I just went into a color wheel to find, and I thought it went well with the color of the blue platform. So this value for reference is 0C4A6E. Let's save, refresh, and now you can see we have a nice dark blue background with a nice light blue platform. So really looking good right here. What else would I do? I think the next thing I would do is make sure that our enemies spawn a little further out so they actually are spawning all over the platform, not just in this concentrated center. So let's find where we're spawning our enemies once more. We want to increase this value right here of position. I'm going to increase it to 10 instead of 5 and see how things look. And it might be getting a little close to the edge there. It might just be straight perfect. Let's see if any actually fall off or hit the edge. And I think that should be good enough. So we can still navigate this. Dodge all of our enemies looks a little hard, but it is totally possible. I like where this is going. Another thing I would do is give our camera a fixed location. If we start right here, it's a little boring and hard to see where enemies are coming at us from. But if we moved our camera back to something like here, it definitely makes our game a little more lively and we can see everything as a whole compared to just being focused on that one vantage point. So how would we move our camera to this position? Well, let's find where we're actually declaring and creating our camera. It's going to be right here at the very beginning. We can take our camera position and then set its X, Y, and Z values. And we are going to set our camera position to these values right here. How did I get these values? Well, I literally just guessed until I got something that I liked. It's as simple as that. So let's see what this looks like when we input these values. The X value is going to be 4.61. The Y value will be 2.74. And Z is going to be 8. We want to make sure that we get rid of this, like so, save. And I think that looks pretty good. Maybe you want to rotate your scene a little more, but this is totally okay for me. And if you ever want to rotate things, you can always just click and drag to make use of your orbit controls once more. But I like the way that looks and how this starts to really give off that 3D feel of, hey, we can move in 3D space. So I'm going to keep this as is. Next, I want to add some sort of jump functionality just in case I really get stuck and I want to hop over one of these enemies instead of being forced to just move around them. So this is actually going to be a lot easier than you think because of the way we set things up. To add in jump functionality, we want to go to our event listener where we key down and we're going to add in a case of space. That's going to listen for our space bar. We'll add the colon, add the break, and now what do we want to do? We want to select our cube, the green cube, and grab its velocity, specifically on the y-axis. We're going to set this equal to a value that launches it up in the air. So we want a positive value, like let's just start with two to see what that looks like. So we already know our cube's position on the y-axis is affected by its velocity, and we're pulling down on it at all times with gravity. So we're going to set it equal to a larger value and gravity is going to take effect and eventually pull it back down. We already set all this up directly within our box class. So this is how easy it is to add jump functionality. We're going to save, refresh, and now when I hit space, you'll see. We are way, way, way up in the sky. That is way too much for our velocity. We always want to make sure that it's being pulled down. So let's change this to something like 0.01 one instead and see what that looks like. Save and refresh, hit space, and that is too little. You can see we're jumping up a little bit, but we can't really get off the ground. So we'll change it to something larger. Let's try point 0.1 instead. Try to find a happy medium, just take some guessing sometimes. And yeah, that is pretty darn good for our jumping, and you'll see gravity just eventually pulls us back down. And now you can see I can easily jump over these other enemies when they come at us. So another thing I'd like to do is just decrease this bounce effect a little bit, add more friction because it seems really bouncy for each time we try to jump over one of these enemies. So to add in more friction, we just want to find our box class, and we're adding friction whenever we apply gravity and we bounce. It's right here. This is our friction value. If we need to be more specific, we should create a const called friction and declare that this new value of 0.5 will be the friction we multiply our velocity on the y-axis by. 
So we multiply by 0.5 instead of 0.8, and that should bring us to the ground quicker, less bounces. And yeah, I think that looks pretty good. So eventually the enemies will start spawning more and more. Here they come. And it might be a little too easy with how high we can jump, so you just kind of want to fine tune things until you find something that's right for you. And I will change this in this video for the velocity on the y-axis when we jump. Change it to 0.5, 0 0.05 that is, excuse me. And that's still too little. So like I said, you just want to make sure you're fine tuning everything to your taste. Change it to 0 0.08. See if I can jump over an enemy. And yeah, that seems to be pretty good for what I want to do. So I think with this, I have a decent looking game that is fun. I guess fun is debatable, but it's good experience for learning how to make a 3GS game in the first place. As we learned all this different 3D movement, physics, gravity, and so forth, collision detection, you name it. So I hope you guys enjoyed learning how to make this game. All the code for this video will be available as a GitHub repo, and the code for every single chapter will be divided into git commit, so you can see exactly what I did for each individual section of our checklist. While this might be the end of this course, darn, but I do have a whole nother library full of 3JS courses and game development courses which you can use to take things to the next level. Check it out right here.